Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. Okay, so that's what it is. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the difference Mm -hmm. between customer service Mm -hmm. and customer experience. When I think customer service, um, I think of the waiter bringing me my food. Mm -hmm. If it's um, something's wrong with my internet, whatever I'm calling a Mm -hmm. call center, that's customer service. But what? How does that? How is that different from customer experience? So customer service is usually prompted by an action. So um, if it's either problem solving or you walking into a business and deciding Uh that you need to... The problem being solved is that you're hungry and you want to eat. And they're providing you with the customer (laughs) service. But then customer experience really is like... It's a relationship between the brand and the customer. And for a brand to really think about... What do I want that process to be in terms of why did a customer even think about approaching my brand for my product or service? That whole end-to-end interaction is the customer experience. Hey everyone, you're listening to Item 13, a bi-weekly podcast covering everything African food, and I'm your host, Yom Tego. Every other week, we'll delve into the world of African food, chefs, curators, and bloggers. I hope you enjoy it. This week... I speak to customer experience specialist and founder of Baroni Consult, Maureen Atebaroni. After studying in Ghana and Canada respectively, she made the permanent move to Ghana in 2015 and decided to set up her consultancy to address the lack of service quality in Ghana's hospitality industry. With a focus on food and beverage and lodging businesses, Baroni Consult provides small and medium businesses with operational consulting and related resources. Maureen spent her free time exploring Ghana's beaches, exploring wellness and self-care, and working on her passion project, Mystery Diner Ghana, an online platform where consumers can anonymously review restaurants in Ghana. I met Maureen in Accra for this fan conversation. She dropped some really good gems on customer dining experiences and insights, as well as tips for small business owners. We talked about her mystery dining project, and she shared a great self-care hack that I think you'll find really useful. As usual for each episode, we ended the conversation with a rapid-fire segment. I hope you enjoyed this one as much as I did. Here's the show. So hi, Maureen. Welcome to Item 13 Podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, why don't we start by you telling us a little bit about yourself? Okay. Um, so my name is Maureen Atibawani. I'm full Ghanaian. Uh, I was raised, actually I was born in Syria. In Syria? <laughs> Wait, I did not know that. Yes, yes. My dad works for the UN. So I was oh. born in Syria and then um, I lived in Israel until I was 10. No way. <laughs> <laughs> and then I moved to Ghana and did um, the rest of my primary school and high school here. And then I moved to Canada from there. And then move back oh to wow! Ghana. And I thought so. I'd been all over the world. <laughs> yeah, so it's been interesting. interesting moving back and forth. But I yeah. see. Mm-hmm. And Israel. Yeah. Do you remember my about living um, in Israel? Or? I mean, I have a good, I have good memories okay. of Israel, and um, I still have friends that live okay. there. Have you been in, in not adult yet. life? Okay. The plan is next year or two. I'm gonna oh, go back. cool! Yeah. I actually was there. Mm, I think like four years ago, oh, really? three or four years ago, like in Tel Aviv and then in Jerusalem. Yeah, and I lived was... in Jerusalem. Yeah, and that so, is. Yeah, I still remember like my neighborhood. Name. <laughs> <laughs> and 
in every No, way. it's funny because um, when I was there, I kept hearing my name because Yom is mm. the word for day yeah. in Hebrew. In Hebrew, yeah. right? So walking the streets of Tel Aviv and then I kept hearing Yom Yom but people were saying good day yeah, to each yeah. other. And I didn't forget that yeah. I was so so confused. Yeah. It was only later that someone told me that oh Yom means um day in Hebrew, I guess. So you moved Ga- back to Ghana mm-hmm. a couple of years ago. Yeah. Why why did you decide to move back? I think when I moved to Canada, I always knew I would come back. Oh, um, it was just a matter of when. Okay. So I would come back once or twice a year um, to visit my family. And then as I was coming back, just like seeing how things were developing. Yeah. And I did come back in 2012 to try and move back. <laughs> <laughs> the and first that attempt. Didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, it was interesting. It prepared me for my later yeah. move, but I couldn't stay. Like yeah. I was I'm, I'm going back to Canada. And then um, finally... 2015, I was like, I'm going to make the move, and I just did it. Like, rip the band-aid off. Yeah. And how has <laughs> it been? How much, how, much has it, how much of it has changed? And... Um, I mean, 2012 definitely helped me, because I think at that point, um, things were a bit rough. <laughs> we, had, we, had, we were deep into the doom oh, yeah, yeah, that's doom right. stage, so it was really rough, like, adjusting then, but then when, when I came back in 2015... I was prepared for that. Okay. Um, and then also in terms of like the work environment, mm-hmm. I was prepared for that as well. And a lot of my friends had moved back as well. Okay. So it wasn't too much of a shock. Okay. Um, it's been a slow transition. Um, I gave myself about a year and a half to really get into it. <laughs> so I didn't put too much pressure on myself. Um, but it's been good. Like, I'm so happy to be back. Yeah. yeah. No plans to move back no, to Canada I can't anywhere else. Anytime see soon. myself living anywhere else. Oh, as wow. frustrating as it is sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like, I know I'm going to be in Ghana. Okay. Like, yeah. Cool. And then um, let's dive into today's topic. Okay. Then, How did you end up in the world of customer experience? Okay. Um, the idea came initially in 2012 when, when I was you were here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I remember I was sitting by the pool um, at La Villa, which is one of my favorite places to go and hang out. And it was like me and my friend just talking about like, you know, I'd always wanted to be in hospitality. Okay. But when I told my dad that I wanted to study hospitality management. <laughs> like a true girl, you told dad. Me, <laughs> you better find something that you can make money off of. Yeah. So he wanted me to be a doctor, a lawyer, engineer. I ended up studying law in oh. university and then decided that I didn't want to okay. practice it. So 2012, I came and that's when like I feel like the seed was sown. Okay. Um, so I, I started like looking into that, moved back, and then I worked in very customer experience and customer service heavy industries okay. um, within education and hospitality in Canada. And then by the time I moved back, I had a, f- a clear idea. Okay, so it was in I- Canada that you sort of got to the um, framework, if you will, for what customer experience is or should be. Exactly. And then match- matching it to your experience in Ghana exactly. and being like, no. Nah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much it. And luckily, when I was in Canada, I moved to Toronto when I moved back from Ghana. Okay. And I was working in education and tourism. So what we were doing was... Um, for any international student that was entering the city of Toronto, we helped them with basically getting settled and finding mm-hmm. homes or um, residences. And so I was exposed to a lot of different cultures as well with like the other tourism agents and a lot of students from China and like from Nigeria mm-hmm. and from India and stuff like that. So it kind of really gave me a more diverse view of what okay. customer experience and mm-hmm. customer service would be or could be. Um, so coming back, I was better prepared um, okay. to address <laughs> the issues. <laughs> yeah. So tell us about what Bawini Consult is today. Mm-hmm. Maybe even what the name means, okay. so what it means to you, what it means if there's a literal okay. meaning. So my last name is Ati Bawini. Um, ah, so I kind of, of course, and it okay. was very weird. Like I was sleeping and I was like, I got it. So, it, and it's spelled differently. Yeah. It's spelled with an E. Mm-hmm. Um, so, people confuse the pronunciation. And I really wanted it to be something that was tied to me, like okay. the name of my yeah. company. And so, I thought of Bawoni, and I changed it to an I. And then later on, I found that in Yoruba, it means like, hello, welcome. Oh, so, it kind of just worked yeah, out. Yeah, that works um, out really nicely. Yeah, so that's where the, the name came from. But Bawoni Consult initially started as a customer service Okay. Company Like, I wanted to train in customer service mm. for different businesses in hospitality, okay. mainly. Um, but it's evolved from that <laughs> um, because I realized in the beginning that um, people or business owners weren't really... 
that eager to invest in customer service because of a number of other issues that we have within the industry, employee retention being the biggest one. Um, So I've had to pivot a lot um, and focus more recently on customer experience and getting business owners to understand that it's not just a service and solving a problem, it's really developing a strategy where you're thinking about the end-to-end right. process for your customer and your company. Okay. So that's what it so is. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the difference mm-hmm. between customer service mm-hmm. and customer experience. Mm-hmm. So when I think customer service, um, I think of the waiter bringing me my food. Mm-hmm. If it's um, something's wrong with my internet, whatever, I'm calling a mm-hmm. call center, that's customer service. Yeah. But what? how does that How is that different from customer experience? So customer service is usually prompted by an action. So um, if it's either problem solving or you walking into a business and deciding Uh that you need to... The problem being solved is that you're hungry and you want to eat. And they're providing you with the customer (laughs) service. But then customer experience really is like... It's a relationship between the brand and the customer. And for a brand to really think about what do I want that process to be in terms of why did a customer even think about approaching my brand for my product or Mm -hmm. service... That whole end-to-end interaction is the customer experience. So everything from you deciding to pick up your phone to see which restaurant you want to go to is part of the customer experience, right? Okay. Um, And then, so you come to Ghana, you set up Barony Consult. Mm -hmm. How did you, and you you kind of touched on it a little bit just now in terms of pivoting several Mm -hmm. times because establishments did not want to invest Mm -hmm. in customer service because of problems Mm -hmm. like... Uh, employee retention yeah. how did you convince me of your current clients that what you're doing is worth their time and resources to put into it in terms of helping their businesses mm-hmm. to do better um, I would say I wasn't driven by money from the beginning and I knew that there was a need for right. the customer experience training and customer service training um, within the industry and even like within all, a lot of industries yes. in Ghana it's not just the <laughs> hospitality yeah. and so I did have to do a lot of things for free. Um, oh, okay. And there were like, one thing that happened was I would go in offering a service and then my clients would ask me for something else. So I would go in for customer service training, but because they had issues with employee retention, they would ask me to find the employees oh, for them. So I ended up recruiting. And then over time, people just started like associating Bawoni with re- recruiting oh, and training see. and finding oh, that's resources right, that I think they I've need. seen you post a few things exactly. about looking for experts exactly. and for ex. Exactly. Okay. So that's how I've had to pivot mainly within yeah. the industry. And then I think I've also been flexible as to... I try not to present myself as someone that's just selling a service, but as a resource person. Okay. So even if they had any kind of issues outside of whatever I was offering, I did offer to help yeah. them with those things. And that's how I've actually developed my client base. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So actually, as you were th- speaking about that, I was thinking, are you a one-woman show then? Are you doing everything yourself? I did for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> how do you do that in crazy You just Accra? have to. Like... I think when you have an idea, it's really hard to delegate, especially over I, okay. I'm the kind You know what? I, I just asked you that question, but I think I, I would agree with you on that. Yeah, I it's hard to, to delegate. Yeah. yeah, and if yeah. it's your, your business that's on the line, yeah. you're even a bit more scared to delegate. Because it's so your I brand and it's exactly. you and you don't want anybody so else to. I had to do it a lot by myself, but over time, I've collaborated with other people. Okay. And then I've hired um, a few younger people that okay. are interested in the industry. So I just hired like a really excellent intern, and she's very passionate oh, about hospitality. Awesome. <laughs> so we can literally sit there for yeah. like two hours oh, talking nice. about hospitality. Yeah. But I, yeah, it's it's kind of like developed and like grown organically. When I'm ready, then someone pops up. I'm like, oh, okay, I, I think yeah. I can work with you. And then we just do the collaboration. Okay. And, and then have you done um, end-to-end customer <laughs> experience? projects, if you will, for any clients in Ghana, and then what do they, um, what's the expectation going into it, and then coming out of it, like, what has their experience, if you will, been? So, one of my earliest clients actually is um, not in hospitality per se, but it's a software company, and what they do is they provide a software that ties into points of sale and marketing for businesses within hospitality and retail, and I started working with them when they were at market entry stage. So I basically developed their okay. customer experience strategy. And that's probably them. the best time to yeah, do it, right? Exactly. <laughs> Before they learn any bad habits. Exactly. Like, let's exactly. do it right from the beginning. So they were just out of beta stage. And um, I helped them basically find their clients and then kind of 
really develop a strategy that worked around their software. Okay. And so now they I'm phasing out of it, but then they have like a certain number of clients within the, like the, the market and they have a concise customer okay. experience um, process and cycle. Um, and I think doing that at that stage, because it was market entry, it gave me a further insight into what the market is okay. here. And in terms of yeah. expectations people have of what am I supposed to expect as a customer from a brand and what the brand should provide a customer in terms of the, the support right. that they have. Um, so I wanted to know, um, with regard to pricing, how do businesses think about that, especially if you're new to the market or the service that you're offering is new to mm-hmm. your client, right? Mm-hmm. But you're trying to show them what the value mm-hmm. is. How do you price that also to make sure that you're not underselling yourself? Because the minute you go too low, then that's you're kind of sort of stuck mm-hmm. in that price range, yeah. I would imagine, for yeah. a long time. But then if you're too high, you, you sort of don't get the opportunity to get into the space and attract clients, right? Yeah. I mean, I think pricing is always going to be tricky, especially because one of the services I was offering, my service is so niche. So if people don't understand the value, then you can't price it too high until they right. see the return on investment and then you can start. So that was my okay. st- strategy. I, I knew that I had to price it a bit lower and I wasn't really targeting big companies. I was targeting small to medium-sized enterprises. So I wasn't trying to price too high. But you need to be able to kind of break down the value of the service that you're mm. offering. So if you're even selling a product, people need to know that they're getting the value for their money. Mm-hmm. Um, and be able to like articulate that from the beginning. Um, so that, that helps me in the beginning. And I also feel like I was lucky that I secured a retainer client very early. Oh, nice, yeah. Um, <laughs> so it kind of cushioned everything yeah. else that I might, have, I might have been doing for free. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you talked about your target market and your target client. Um, and I think I may have asked this a little bit, but let's ask it in a different way in terms of how you found your clients. So you said you're looking specifically at smaller companies. Mm-hmm. I don't know if for now or mm-hmm. if that's your strategy like long term, but how do you find these clients? How do they come to you? Is it through referrals? Like are you putting ads out mm-hmm. there? How do you, how does someone think about growing a customer or yeah. a client base? Um, in the beginning, I did a lot of door to door like I would literally oh, walk into for real yeah. I was like no I need, to, I need to get these people to understand that I'm serious because I feel like oh, you can see a flyer yeah. you can see an ad and maybe someone might mention but no one's going to explain right, it yeah. the way you do so I would go door to door ask for the business owner if I can't get the business owner I would ask for the manager and then schedule meetings and pitch like tell them this is what I'm trying to do mm. and one thing that I always did in the beginning was I would go in and assess the business okay tell them the weak points that I noticed. And most of them already know that these are our weak points. <laughs> so like, these are the solutions that I want to offer. And like, that's honestly how I started signing up clients. And then I had like a lot of friends that would just talk about okay. someone would be like complaining about issues yeah. they had in their business. Like, Oh, you should talk to Maureen. You know, okay. this is what she yeah. does. And then people would call me and it's still like that. Like yeah. people would just pick up the phone and call me like, can we have a meeting? Yeah. That's some hustle. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so I think this is a good time to take a short break. And then when we come back, we'll delve into specifically customer experiences and food establishments in a crowd. (laughs) (laughs) You guys should see her face right now. She's like ready to dive into this. Okay, we'll take a break and then we'll be right back. Welcome back from the short break. Um, so now specifically customer experiences in food establishments, restaurants, etc. in Accra. What for you are the top three customer experience challenges that you think restaurants, food places in Accra have to deal with? Okay, so I, I think for me, I'll just list them and okay. I'll delve sure. a bit deeper. But the first one is customer centricity. Okay. So I find that the establishments, establishments aren't really making the customer the center of their okay. business. Everyone's opening a restaurant and maybe they have like different kinds of food, but how are they really making the customer the forefront of their business? That's really something that I look out for when I'm going to different, like even with my clients, yeah. I ask them, are you creating a customer loyalty program yeah. so that your customers are coming back? Are you thinking That's about a good point. I don't think retention? I know 
any place in there's well, a few Vida Vida does yeah and I think um, Cafe Quai also does it oh they yeah. do actually and there's a few places that do it I mean Vida is the one that in second cup yeah. does it the coffee shops generally have their cards that's yeah, easy to yeah. stop but they're not collecting customer data and so with customer centricity like you're collecting that data and generating insights okay. um, and then you can actually track your customers buying behavior mm-hmm. and that puts you in the best place okay. to develop your customer experience okay. Um, the second thing is education. And it's two sided. <laughs> because, in as much as the business owners are not really educating themselves on the customer, yeah. the customers are not educating themselves <laughs> on what they should be getting from yeah. the businesses. And my bottom line when I'm talking to anyone is like, you are spending money that you worked hard for, yeah. you should be able to demand a certain type of service or customer right. service or customer experience. Um, so, education is also a really big challenge. And I find, um, if you don't like one of the things that I spoke about on like my blog was um, service charge and what it means. Yeah. And people just think that service charges on their receipt and they have to pay it, but you're paying for good service. Yeah. Like you're literally saying, I had good service and today. Some people can make you feel very bad about that. <laughs> I mean, I've been to a place in Accra, which I would name, where the service was terrible. Mm-hmm. So I didn't, I wasn't going to leave a tip and I was yeah. leaving. The, the waiter stopped me and said, Oh, madam, by the way, <laughs> It's customary to leave like five, <laughs> two to five CD. And I'm like, That's you don't sweet. ask me for a tip. I yeah. give you a tip exactly, exactly because you gave me good service, yeah. right? But see, that, that begs the question, are the business owners telling them that this is what it is? Oh, and it's, it's so like really deep rooted because you also have to wonder, our business, do they, is there a model for the tips, right? So are they putting all their tips in the tip jar and sharing it sharing. at the end of the night? Or is the business owner taking a majority of the tips and not giving it to the service? Right, and I also thought... At least from my experience living outside the country, in the U.S. specifically, I should say, that the tip system is also part of um, waiters and waitresses' wages. Right? Mm-hmm. They don't pay them as much as they should, mm-hmm. and they expect that they make up for that with tips. Yeah. And so then the waiters and waitresses go out and yeah, they're they're give exceptional service yeah, exactly. to get the tips. Mm-hmm. But here I feel like it's not part of that structure, right? I, I don't know how well or not people in the service industry are being paid, but I don't think tips are being considered factored or into factored it. into, yeah. into yeah. their ultimate... I mean, I do know a few establishments that have really good tip systems, but like I said, it's education. Right. And the, edu- the issue with education stems from how educated the waiters themselves are before they start working with yeah. these establishments and being able to train them because they might not be as well educated okay. um, this, if, as their skill development within the establishment. So that's something that really factors into okay. the challenges yeah. in the food industry. And then finally, I think people are very complacent and mediocre. <laughs> We've accepted mediocrity <laughs> in this society. It's like you, you'll go to a place and you know that it's not the best service, but is better than this other yeah. place. So I'm going to still go there. Even though they could ramp up their service right. or their food quality, we've just kind of gotten so complacent. Accepted yeah, it. Yeah, this is what it's going to exactly. be. Like, I always, always, always tell, my husband likes this um, wache place mm-hmm. in Adabraka. I mean, it's not fine. I mean, it's yeah. like a store. She has a wache. But she's really, really popular. Mm-hmm. And so you go there, she opens at 12. You go there at 11.15 and people are already lining up. And I think... One, because she knows people will show up no matter what. No matter what. <laughs> she takes her time. She moves so slowly. She's not friendly or polite. Mm-hmm. And then people also have accepted it that, oh, this is, quote, unquote, the best washi mm-hmm. that is in this part of the city, this part of the town. And so I'm going to wait one hour mm-hmm. while she decides to do whatever and it's just like you said, we've just accepted yeah. it as this is the way it should be. Mm-hmm. I mean, she could have a better system. Yeah. But she's decided, I've, I've had this business for, for a while. For a while. Exactly. I'm not going to have other people serving me. And you could, there's space for her to have at least two other people. But I think she also wants to have control. that yeah, control. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So you're waiting for an hour when you literally could be waiting for 15 minutes. Yeah. Because she wants to completely control the experience, yeah. quote unquote. And I mean, that's a typical example of the difference in customer service and customer experience. Because... The customers have associated that behavior with the brand, yeah. so they don't expect anything else, and they're fine with it. I mean, granted, it could be better, <laughs> but everyone is like, okay, I'm still going to stay, and yeah. this is what I want. But customer service would be just, okay, well, this is the problem now, let me solve it, and like not think about okay. it anymore. So it's really that expectation as a, like with the right. brand, that's what customer experience is. Okay. 
Interesting. So on the flip side, I know we've talked a lot about what's wrong <laughs> with customer experience in Accra. So let's try to look at the other end and see, what, like from your perspective, what's working well. And I'll tell you an experience I had earlier this morning at a new place in Accra. I, I don't know if I should mention the names <laughs> or not. Um, now, it was a good experience, so I, it's, it's not a knock on the establishment. But I think on the flip side, some places try almost too hard. Where for me, I find it to be almost uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. So you walk in and like they all, all the waiters and waitresses rush on you mm-hmm. and they come to your table, they check every five minutes, <laughs> they're standing in the corner like all watching you. I, I feel uncomfortable eating because I know they're standing there like mm-hmm. ready for your next move. And I understand they've been like, I've seen on social media that, oh, we're closed for training. So mm-hmm. I know they're training their people. Mm-hmm. They want, it's a new place. So yeah. I know they want to be top notch. Mm-hmm. But like, how much is too much? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's such a tricky question. Um, I mean, I mean, the fact that you're saying that they're training is good yeah. because you really have to also assess the kind of customers that you have coming in. You know, you might go into one establishment and you want that kind of attention, and then you might go to another one where it's more casual and you just want to go yeah. in, have your coffee or whatever, and then leave and yeah. not have too much interruption. And especially if it's like an environment where people are talking. Right. So if you're going to a coffee shop where people are having meetings, you need to train your staff to know that you can't interrupt a business <laughs> meeting because you want to deliver yeah. your excellent customer service. But it's really also being able to train your staff and give them that little amount of leash to be able to make that decision by themselves because not every customer is the same. Right. And some people want that attention. So it's getting them to the point point. where they can be almost autonomous in providing the service that you want them to provide. So, yeah, it's a tricky (laughs) question. But, yeah, I mean... Yeah, and I mean... And I'll say, because you mentioned Cafe Quiet, so I'll say I also go to Cafe Quiet quite a bit to Mm -hmm. work. And I think they found the right balance Mm -hmm. where... Now when I walk, because I go there so much, <laughs> when I walk in, there's a particular waitress mm-hmm. that knows me because mm-hmm. I'm there all the time. And I think she's found the right balance. Mm-hmm. Like as soon as I walk in, she knows, she knows I'm coming to work because mm-hmm. I'm carrying my laptop, all of that stuff. So she finds, she'll literally take me to a table where there's a socket. Mm-hmm. She knows I will be comfortable with, she knows I bring so many things. <laughs> she yeah. gives me a big enough table. There's a socket and all of that good stuff. She brings me the menu right away. Nine times out of ten, she'll ask me if I'm getting the same thing. Nine times yeah. out of ten, I'll get the same yeah, exactly. thing. Um, yeah. And then she leaves me. She's not hovering. She's exactly. not. She knows. Like we've got, kind of gotten into this rhythm, and I think they've they found that balance, mm-hmm. right? Of like providing service but not being intrusive. Yeah, exactly. Right? So exactly. I, there's there's a good there's a good balance to be had. Um, Let's switch gears now and talk about your passion project, which I think is kind of tied into what yeah. your day job is. So you run Mystery Diner Ghana. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? Okay, so Mystery Diner Ghana is basically an online review platform. Um, we have a lot of food bloggers, which I love, but I realized that I had a lot of friends coming to me and providing feedback about different establishments mm-hmm. that they went to. And I was like, okay, well, I can't go to every single person yeah. and be like, this is what someone said about your establishment. So I created Mystery Diner. Um, You can simply go online through our social media platforms and submit a review on your phone. And it's completely anonymous. I don't know who sends in the reviews. And sometimes people just like kind of (laughs) snitch on themselves. (laughs) Like, did you get my review? And I'm like, I didn't know who sent it. But the premise is that you should be able to give free, honest feedback and not feel like someone might spit in your food because you told someone (laughs) (laughs) about, like, you gave them negative feedback. And I think that's one of the things, like, um, we're just kind of, as a society, we're kind of a bit hesitant to go to a manager and we're not sure what kind of response we're going to get from the managers or the business owners or even the wait staff about something being wrong with our food. So we just pay and we leave. But, um, so yeah, I started it and it's kind of grown by by itself I think people have things to say about where they're eating (laughs) and businesses are paying a bit more attention to it because they know I think some businesses the owners aren't there all the time and the wait staff starts to slack off or something might happen and you see the reviews and like oh my god thank you for letting me know about that so that was mystery diner. Okay. Yeah. I've used it myself since I've been in Accra the last couple of weeks and I love it. I feel like it's now the sort of the highlight of my dining oh, experience. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, like I go in, I'm like, okay, I'm looking out for all these things. Because I think the first time I filled it out, like I didn't I didn't look ahead to see what the mm. questions will be. But now that I sort of have an mm-hmm. idea, I'm looking at this like when I'm walking in, like mm-hmm. what it looks like on the outside. Things mm-hmm. I didn't pay attention to yeah. or notice before, but I know like, oh I'm gonna have to wait for this and this and this. So let me think through that. But I mean do you think Ghanaians care that much about 
all of that though? Or do you think like with my um, Wachi example, they just want their food and done? And I think Ghanaians are beginning to care. Um, also, like we've seen like since 2012, the progression in terms of options when it comes to dining out. Yeah. We have so many <laughs> options now. I think there was maybe one or two coffee shops when I was here in 2012, and now we have Second Cup, we have Vida E. We have like just too many options. Yeah. So that's also creating a lot of competition within the marketplace, right? So customers can go to one place and have a really good experience. And if they go to another place and it's bad, they're going to talk about yeah. it because someone else can do it better. And so, social media too, I guess. Exactly. Media Twitter is, is <laughs> the best place. <laughs> Twitter will let you have it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I do think people care. Um, one, like you said, when you first did the mystery diner assessment, you, there were a lot of things that you weren't paying attention to, and that's one of the the pillars of mystery right. diner. Like we want people to know that if they're going into an establishment, it's just not about the food; yeah. it's about <laughs> everything. Like, is the table clean? Right. When you get there, did someone greet you? Yeah. Was your receipt correct? Little that things was like a that good question. that, that you have like, to pay ah. attention to. <laughs> and businesses are really starting to think, okay, well, if someone are you are they even giving you receipts? Right. I mean, you should get a receipt, but. They're starting to like ramp up their service and their food quality mm. and stuff because they're getting that feedback and people are not holding back. There's some reviews <laughs> I read them and I'm like my heart. So is do ready. you pub- do you publish them like I have to okay because I can't compromise the integrity yeah. of it and it's a it's a the review is there for a reason. Okay, I think there's always going to be the question of someone like sending in a review to ramp up their business right. and stuff. But overall, I feel like the reviews we've gone have been very honest. Right. And we've had businesses come back and ask if they could like, give a refund to the customer. But I can't even do that because yeah, I don't know don't who the know customer who, is. That's right. um, so we know that they're paying attention to it and that over time, as people do it more and more, it's going to be even more credible and more legitimate. Yeah, that's good. Industry, yeah. I mean, I think it's good that they are, it sounds like for the most part, are reacting in a positive way because yeah. I'm not sure how, I don't know if you've had any business owners because of really bad reviews kind of. In the beginning, that was one of my fears. Um, I was actually scared that I didn't... Because it's tied so much to what I do. I didn't want to let anyone know I was behind it. Oh. So for, like, I think the first six months, no one knew I was behind it but, like, my close friends. But then I also realized that the businesses should have an opportunity to respond to right. stuff. And they need to contact someone. And so I just kind of dealt with it. But luckily, it's been pretty positive, like 98%. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think when you have enough reviews from like one establishment, you begin to see trends. Yeah. So there's one establishment in particular that has really good reviews for their food, but their service is consistently okay. bad. And you can't say that there's a lie and right. yeah. several people are saying the same thing. So I try to send the reviews to business owners like, oh, okay, this, is, this okay. is what's coming out. Um, just wanted to give you a heads up and let them know that we're not trying to shame right. and like bash any business. We're really just trying to give them the opportunity to see what their customers think about what they're providing okay. them. No, well, that's really cool. Like I've enjoyed using it a lot. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> like, one more thing to my dining experience. Um, so you run your consultancy firm. Mm-hmm. You're doing this mystery dining thing like how do you find time to take care of yourself mm. and like I've been in Accra now for a couple of weeks and I'm just like between the traffic yeah. and the heat and all of that stuff I mean how do I you think... find a quiet oasis so how do, how do you self-care I guess mm. so I mean unfortunately and in a roundabout way fortunately for me like I lost during that year that I started my business I lost my mom oh my goodness and I'm it so was sorry. <laughs> And it was such a pivotal moment and experience oh. for me because starting a business is hard enough. Yeah. And then going through that was also very hard, oh but goodness. it made me really realize how important it is to take care of yourself. So I don't play about my free time. Yeah. Like my Sundays, if I have to go to the pool, <laughs> even if I have deadlines, I'm going to the pool. And I've just really focused so much on like your productivity, your productivity is affected by how well you're doing yeah. as an individual. So I tap into how I'm feeling on a daily basis and I do a lot of meditation and really just like inflection, like, okay, is everything going well? How am I feeling about this? I'm a beach lover, so I go to the beach (laughs) as much as often. And then um, I do a weird thing called uh, uh, personal inventory dates. Oh, I do it once you a tell month. Us, yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. It's really kind of changed my life. <laughs> um, it's basically one day dedicated to taking stock of what you want to improve on with yourself oh. and also taking the time to, you know, pat yourself on the back. 
So for the last That's month, fantastic. yeah, you set your goals and figure out what challenges you had. Mm-hmm. Like I include prayer points, yeah. things I want to pray about, things I want to develop. If I want to save this, is how much I want to save the next month. And every month I go back to that. And so I've been doing it for like about the last six months. And you can really see how oh you're changing and progressing yeah. as an individual. So that sounds like a really really intentional yeah. way of like living your life. You have to be yeah. intentional. Yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a good tip for me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So before we transition to the rapid fire section, can you let us know where people can find you online if, it, if it's businesses that are looking for your services mm-hmm. or people want to try Mystery Dining? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and um, Instagram. As Bowoni Consults for my business, if you want any kind of uh, assessment or training, you can you can contact me through social media. And then um, for Mystery Dana, I'm also on Facebook, social media, and Twitter, Mystery Dana Ghana. Okay. I'm on there. Yeah. All right. And then we'll have that in the show notes for those who are looking to either work with Maureen or rate your own restaurants <laughs> or cafes as you go about your dining in Accra. Um, so this is the final section of the interview, my hopefully favorite part of the interview too. We're going to do some questions and then you tell me off the top of your head mm-hmm. what the answer is. You can love it if you want, but you don't have to and then we'll just go on to the next thing. Because this is a food, a Ghanaian, well, African food in general, but because we're in Ghana today, we'll start with a question you should expect. <laughs> Ghana jollof or Niger jollof? Oh, oh, come on. No, definitely Ghana jollof. Okay. If my life depended on it, yeah. <laughs> Buffet or a la carte? A la carte. Swallow or rice? Swallow. Red wine or white wine? White wine, for sure. You know what? Actually, rosé. Oh. Rosé, girl. Okay. So that's even like a blend. Like, I can't even... Oh, yeah. that's a good, good yeah. answer. Good answer. Coffee or tea? It used to be coffee. <laughs> when I lived in Canada, it was coffee, but I'm definitely a tea, herbal tea person okay. now, for sure. Uh, dining or takeout? Oh, that's so tricky. <laughs> it depends on my mood. I li- I'm a homebody, so I like to like take out. But takeout must be hard, in, or maybe not takeout, but delivery is hard in Accra. That's I'm, a whole different yeah. issue. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so pick up. Okay. Uh, morning person or night person? Night person. Instagram or Twitter? Instagram. Your biggest pet peeve? It's hard. Lying? Oh. Yeah. I have a really big thing of lying. <laughs> like, don't ever let me catch you. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then your favorite African restaurant anywhere in the world doesn't have to be in Ghana. African restaurant. Like, where they're serving local, like, African food. You know what? In Ghana, I would just say in Ghana, my favorite is living room. Oh, actually, I, that's a good one. Because I, I find a lot of people well. say Buka. And Buka is fine, but living room I find consistently. Okay, like, I actually and they have been like all sorts well. of different. Yeah. yeah, have you been to um, Asmara? I have, but it was a while ago. Okay, I haven't been. In but a long, like in terms time. of well, there's variety, yeah, variety, price points. Um, oh, yeah. There's always Asmara. so much to choose from. Okay. Yeah, I definitely. Oh, living I haven't room. been in a while. Yeah, that's a go. good reminder yeah. to <laughs> check it out. Um, okay, well, thank you so much thank for your time. You I had so much fun. Who, who knew? It was so much <laughs> fun talking about customer yeah. experience. This was great. Um, and yeah, hopefully this was also insightful for you. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to Item 13, an Essence 13 production. If you like the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes. To keep up to date on news and events from Essence 13, Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Essence and the number 13. Thank you.